So first Thess or second Thessalonians is where we will be at. And if you were paying attention to the reading of the text, you will notice that there's going to be maybe some e uneasiness in some of the stuff we will talk about this morning. How many of you realize that just because it's not easy doesn't mean it's not good? Did you get that? And so, um, and so we're going to be talking about something that honestly is not talked about very much in modern church, in corporate America. And, um, and I'm praying that for strength this morning um, because I'm, uh, I'm a little irritated at both sides on this. <clears throat> because in studying, not irritated, that's a bad word. That means that I'm going to be mad this morning. I'm not mad. Um, I'm concerned that a vast majority of churches do not practice biblical church discipline. Biblical church discipline. In our notes, we call it church family discipline because I believe it is a local church responsibility to exercise discipline when our members are, should, are growing in sinful behavior and they become, and are becoming more peaceful with sin. Now, how many of you recognize that none of us are perfect? All right? How many of you have a hard time hearing because some of you didn't raise your hand? <laughs> We're not perfect. Paul emphasizes this, that we wrestle with this flesh. Yes, indeed, justified, but still wrestling with the old man. That means we still struggle. That means there's still that temptation in our lives and we succumb to it. In times of weakness where our flesh has temporary victory in our lives, even as believers. So I want you to understand this morning that we're not talking about, um, we're not in this, um, in a perfectionist movement. And sadly, there's, there's some who believe that. They believe themselves to never to sin again after salvation. Nowhere in Scripture do we find that. We pursue perfection. We pursue holiness. We pursue to grow and mature in Christ. Oh, but, but to be perfect? No, that will not take place until we are in our glorified state. Till God Himself, a work that Jesus does, the final sanctification act of removing the flesh and all the tentacles that go along with it from us. And we are like Him. But that doesn't happen here on this earth. Which means that our churches, the church, and all the local expressions of it are made up of people who aren't perfect. People who still struggle with sin. What that means, as Paul says, that he had to, he had to mortify his flesh... He had, to, he had to discipline himself. So let me, let me put two words together, okay? Disciples are supposed to be disciplined. Okay? Disciples are supposed to be disciplined. But not independently disciplined. What does that mean? That means that God, through the Holy Spirit, works in your life and disciplines you. If we go to Hebrews, we find that God, whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth. He disciplines. Let's use a practical, um, a practical example very quickly. You ever been in the grocery store or been in the restaurant? And there's a child that's doing whatever they want, wherever they want, 
and however they want to do it. And I know, and you see two parents sitting here, eating their food, or doing this, and, and just kind of like indifferent. That is an undisciplined child. But you would say that that child should be what? Disciplined by his mother and father. Correct? In fact, we would think less of the parents. Okay? If they aren't making any attempts to discipline the child. Now, I'm not talking about abusing the child. I'm not talking about embarrassing the child and hurting the child. And I mean, I'm talking about disciplining the child. Letting the child know who's the child and who's the adult. Letting the child know who's in charge and who's not in charge. Showing the child how the child is supposed to act. I'm finding out more and more, and this is like, and this is for those of you who have already gone through this, you've already experienced it. I'm finding out more and more that you have to do less public disciplining when you do more private. Right? Um, so you've seen times where kids are in the store and they do be, and they still, even though they've been disciplined privately, they still, there's, you know, the Bible says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Okay? And so the child just wants to play. The child just wants to, you know, wants to go around, wants to throw the beans across the aisle, you know? I mean, it just wants to do those things. But you know whenever there's been an implementation of discipline because the father does the look. You know the look? I got the look. The boys know the look. It's not a look of, I'm going to kill you. It's the look of, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> no, it's the look of, you know how you're supposed to be acting. You know this is rude. We've talked about this. We've been over this before. It's time to settle up, settle down, and move on. The look. Discipline is good. When it's done right. So we have an extreme in church culture. We have discipline that is aggressive and can even be vengeful. It's mean. It's heartless. But then we have, because the, the pendulum has to swing or because there's an overcompensation, we have a church culture of no discipline, no confrontation, no correction. That, that, that's, that's none of my business. Sorry, it is your business. This body, if, if there's infection in this hand, it's my arm's business. It's my neck's business. It's my eye's business. Why? Because it's a part of the body. And too often times... There's sin, and it's mean, and it's vengeful in how the church goes about disciplining it. But honestly, most of the time, we kind of swing this way because naturally, we don't want confrontation. We're afraid of what people are going to think about us. You're a holy roller. Oh, there he is, holier than thou. Well, Paul here, in the most, as I'm reading, I thought it would be like very obscure where he places this in this text or in this letter. But 
Paul gives us a picture here of discipline because he says, I hear there are some among you who are not working. Sin. (laughs) But we don't think about it that way. When have you heard, have you ever heard of someone being under the church discipline process because they're lazy? No, most of the time they're just the most of the time they're just the topic of conversation in the hallway. Because we even though we don't like laziness and we don't like mooching, as Paul dealt with and we talked extensively about that last week. We don't like it. But we struggle with it being, quote unquote, a sin. And when someone gives themselves over to it in laziness and mooching, we, we barely, very rarely will we look at it and say, that's a sin issue. There's a pattern in that professing believer's life where they are at peace with living in sin. Now, we think about the other things. We think about sexual sin. We think about someone who is, um, who's not being faithful with their spouse. I mean, I, I mean, inevitably, most of the time, it's because of adultery, church discipline. Most of the time. But very rarely do we go beyond that. But Paul here takes something, and, I, and it's purposeful by the Holy Spirit. He takes something that we, would, that we don't like, but we struggle with calling it sin. And he says, you need to exercise church discipline on them. So let's look at, let me give you a couple of things very quickly. <clears throat> let me remind you last week as we navigated towards the middle part of this chapter last week. That work is, divinely appoint, is a divinely repo, um, appointed responsibility that precedes the fall. We were commanded to work before sin entered the world. So... Working is not a curse of, of sin. Okay? Remember, we were gardeners, then the fall, now we're farmers. Okay? Therefore, if anyone should embrace good work ethic, it should be genuine believers. We should work hard for pleasure, for money, for things. For status? For power? No. We should work hard for the glory of God. Because it pleases God. Because we identify with God's plan for our lives through hard work. So Paul, we we addressed laziness last week and mooching. So now we're freeloading. Let's, Let's get to our theme for today. Our theme is God's people are means of grace. God's people are means of grace. Now, let's break down that, okay, as we're moving into church family discipline today. And I don't want to lose you. And if you're new with our if you're new to our church, this is we desire to be a biblical local New Testament church. Not a cool church. Okay, not a traditional church. We want to be a biblically healthy church, which means that if the Bible teaches it, we want to follow it. And we don't skip over things. We go verse by verse through the scriptures. We we introduce context, how they applied it in their day. We bring it to our context and we apply it in our day. And then we, we interpret the scriptures based on the scriptures. So in light of that, let's break down what this statement means in our thing. God's people are means of grace. Number one, God's people. What do we mean by that? This is your first Note, um, the New Testament believers in whom God indwells, okay? So when we say believe, or when we say God's people, all right, we are not talking about just a, a, someone who identifies with a group of people. We're talking about people who genuinely God indwells. 
Just as God promised Israel, that promise then translated into the local New Testament church. Exodus says this, I will dwell in them and they will dwell with me. That is, that is what we mean by God's people. In our context, that is believers, the genuine believers in the gospel. Means of grace. Maybe if you, if you have a Catholic background and you've heard this statement before, you may, um, you may have heard this explained differently. But this is what we're meaning. This is what, what Baptists, this is what um, Protestant churches mean by means of grace. God gives grace in order to sustain and empower the Christian life. God gives grace in order to sustain and empower the Christian life. So with those two statements, let's break down what our theme is. When we said God's people are means of grace, what we are saying is is that local New Testament believers in the gospel are used by God to sustain and empower fellow believers in the gospel. God uses you to help them sustain and be empowered in their Christian walk. And vice versa. We are a means of grace. It's not just the Holy Spirit. We've said this over and over again, especially in our study of the church. Christianity is not a celebration of individuality. It is a corporate partnership. Let me try to go a little bit deeper with that. You are not the church. We are the church. We are. You're not the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. So so God's people are used as means of grace. That's our thing as we go forward. Think about that. Think about the people in your life right now. Think about your fellow church members right now. God expects you to help sustain and empower their life in this Christian walk. God expects that from you. God has that plan for you. Now, let's get to church family discipline. The reason I call it church family is because we are a family. We're called that. We are of the household of faith. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. That may sound weird to the world. But, it, but you can tell in a, in a regenerate mind. That makes sense in this statement. My wife is my wife. My wife is the mother of my children. My wife is my sister. Now some people would say you must be from somewhere else. <laughs> okay. But Christians get that, don't we? And I'm her brother. And God is going to use me as a means of grace in her life. To sustain and empower her. Can we stop there just for a moment? Even just with our our marriages? Are you answering the call? Husbands? To sustain and empower your wife? In her Christian walk. Wives are you answering the call. To sustain and empower. Your husbands. In their spiritual. In their Christian walk. Are you dragging them down. Across aisles. Church members and church members. Sustain and empower. We are a family. And I'm not going to break out in song there. Okay. But we are. We are a family. Church family discipline is this. The process of correcting sinful behavior among members of a local church body for the purpose 
of protecting the church, restoring the sinner to a right walk with God, and renewing fellowship among the church members. That was long, so I'll read it one more time. Church family discipline is the process of correcting sinful behavior among members of a local church body for the purpose of protecting the church, restoring the sinner to walk right with God, and renewing fellowship among the church members. That is church family discipline in a nutshell. I gave you some text down here. Matthew 18. We will read that in just a moment. That is from the very words of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, an entire chapter in which Paul is having to address the church of Corinth because get this, a man, okay, a man is sleeping with his dad's wife. Okay? So it's either his mom or stepmom. It was so, I mean, that, even the pagans in Corinth said that was a no-no. Paul references that. He said this is something that is even beyond the works of Gentiles. So this is heinous. And he says this about the church. And you sit back with arrogance. The church was sitting back and a man that was in their assembly, local church, okay? That's one thing you need to find out. Everything's in local church context in the New Testament. From Matthew 16 on, local New Church, I mean, local New Testament church context. Ephesus, local New Testament church. Thessalonica, local New Testament church. Philippi, local New Testament church. Colossae, local New Testament church. Okay? Galatia, local New Testament church. Corinth, local New Testament church. Okay? So these are things that are happening inside of a church. So basically, if Paul were to ever write a letter to Emmanuel, what context would it be in? Local New Testament church. Okay? Because we are a pattern of a local New Testament church. Okay, I think y'all got that. Okay? So they're just sitting back and he walks them through church discipline. How are you supposed to handle that? Y'all were thinking, yeah, dude's sleeping with his stepmom or his mom. I mean, good gracious. And still doing it. Didn't Not one time, not, not like, okay, the, the, the present tense of the Greek there is that he has his father's wife. He's continuing on. I don't want to go much further than that, okay? It grosses me out, all right? 2 Corinthians 5, Galatians 6, James 5, 2 John 1, Romans 16. Those are only a few I gave you. I didn't give you 1 Timothy chapter 5 or Titus chapter 3. I mean, I could have kept going on and on, but I wanted to give you a few here where we are compelled by the example of the uh, local New Testament church to exercise church family discipline. But what's this process? We haven't even gotten to our text today. But let me, let me um, read Matthew 18. I feel like we need to go right to the horse's mouth. Okay? <clears throat> Remember, Matthew 16 is the establishment of the church. So now we're looking inside a context of the church. And we see the process. Moreover, in verse 15 of Matthew 18, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Okay? Stop right there. The process. Step one. One-on-one. -on -one. Someone struggling with sin in the church? You don't go to your girlfriends. You don't go to the, to the men's group. One-on-one. -on -one. That's what you do. You sit down and you talk to them. We're going to talk about the heart of it in a minute. But that's step one. Verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, then, okay, all right, I made a concerted effort. It doesn't say, give up on them, they're done, don't talk to them. It says, then, step two, take with thee one or two more. So at your discretion, one or two more, 
<clears throat> depending on the situation, sometimes it's better to take one. Why? Because if you take two, then it's kind of like a three-on-one thing and they feel like they're being ganged up on. And maybe it, it, it intensifies the situation. So sometimes one is better. But sometimes there's two people that maybe they really have had a good relationship with. And sometimes it eases the situation. So there's discretion there that Jesus gives. One or two more. Okay? Um, that, in, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Okay? That's an Old Testament Jewish custom. Okay? Two or three witnesses to acknowledge that sin is being committed. All right? Um, every word shall be established, shall be put on record, all right? If you ever have to confront someone or have to talk to someone about sin and it gets to step two, this is when Jesus says some notes need to be taken. Something needs to be written down. There needs to be a record kept. First one, he didn't say that. Go to them and talk to them and so that they will hear you and then it doesn't go in. It's just brothers and sisters. It's just, it's just talking that way. But he says then that it may be established, that it may be on record. And if he neglect to hear thee, tell it unto the pastor. Tell it to the elders. Tell it to the deacons. Tell it to the women's auxiliary. Tell it to... The... No. Tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church... Let him be unto thee as a heathen, a Gentile, that was recognized as not believers in God. In our context, unregenerate men, people who have not been redeemed, or a publican, okay? They, they didn't like publicans, okay? That's what you do. You let them be as unto that. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever... Ye shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Oh, that's been greatly taken out of context. We don't have time to go too much in that. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by, of my Father which is in heaven. Word of faith movement takes and runs with that. That does not mean you get whatever you want if two of you want it, okay? That's not what that means. Verse 20. This is greatly misused. It's quoted in prayers. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, a lot of times we say, Lord, we know that you say where two or three are gathered, you will be in our midst. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about church discipline. He's saying where two or three people have been gathered and are so passionate about my holiness and about my glory that they are willing to do the uncomfortable and talk to someone about their sin. He says, I will be with them. And I will, it gets my stamp of approval. That is the context of where two or three are gathered. So we see the process. One, then one or two extra, okay? If they don't hear it, you go to the church. What does that look like? Okay, that means that you go, that you go to your pastors, you say we have, this, we have this sin, and it needs to be brought before the church, and our membership needs to be made aware of it. Because Paul goes into greater detail and says that there is a responsibility on pastors to also evaluate to make sure there's not ulterior motive of why this person is being brought to the church and so forth, that everything will be done holy, righteous, and in unity. So there's just a few words that I want to put out about church discipline very quickly before, we, before I give you some, um, I'm going to give you five truths about church discipline that we find in First Th or Second Thessalonians. The word confront. We don't like the word confront when we think about brothers and sisters in Christ. Confronting is hard. It's easier to ignore. It's easier to hope. Right? It's easier for us to just say, well, just maybe, maybe they'll just, it, they'll get over it. And maybe, no, confront. That's not a suggestion, is it? 
That is a command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Confront. When people are in sin, we confront them. Now, we're going to talk about the heart of it in a minute. I'm just giving you these words right now. You say, man, this sounds, this is a mean church. No. Wait, we're going to get there. The second one, another one, Titus chapter 3, reject. If they've been confronted, if they've been talked to, if they have been, and and they're just not going to, they're not going to submit to the scriptures, they're not going to submit to the gospel that saved them, they're not going to acknowledge that that they need to be at war with their sin and not at peace with their sin, it says reject them. Reject them. We see that also in first, um, and, and contextually the word reject is for those who are heretics, okay? That's the context of the one who is in sin in Titus chapter 3. They're teaching false doctrine that is heretical to the gospel, and he says reject them, cast them out. And also the same thing in Second John chapter 1. Let me give you a couple more words. Avoid. Paul said in first. Um, said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says don't even eat with them. You don't even eat in their company. Romans chapter 6, he said mark them who cause division. Do you know that an act of discipline is that if somebody is gossiping in the church that you don't talk to them? Not because you're stuck up, it's because you know gossiping is sin. And, and to say, don't want to hear that. And go on your way. Forgive is actually a word for discipline. Second Corinthians chapter 2, 5 through 11, talks about someone that causes grief. But then when they come back and they ask for forgiveness, that you are to forgive them. Restore. Galatians chapter 6. It says if a man has been overtaken in fault... Restore such a brethren when he comes with a spirit of meekness. Convert, James chapter 5. It says, if any of you err from the truth and one converts him, that means changes his direction, says you've saved his soul. These are just a few of the words of a few of these texts that I've given you. But let me give you the truths that we find in First Thessalonians, or Second Thessalonians, the second letter to the church of Thessalonica. Verse 6 says this. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. The ESV says idle, who walks idle. And they're not in according to the traditions in which he received from us. They're de- deliberately disobeying the commands. So we see, number one, church family discipline, as we have already emphasized, is an authoritative command. What is the ramifications of us saying that? Of us acknowledging that in the scriptures with the text that I've shared, with the examples given, and then even by the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and now by the Apostle Paul here in 2 Thessalonians. What I'm telling you is, if our church family sees sinful behavior by one of our members, and we turn a blind eye to it, we are living in direct rebellion against Christ. Because it is an authoritative command. It's not a suggestion. And by the way, I know this isn't in your church growth magazine. Okay? Most people will say, get the front door wide open and make the back door really small. But we need to understand, in Ephesians chapter 5, in Ephesians chapter 5, whenever this lesson is given to us about the husband and the wife. And Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride. What does it say that it desires for Christ to be able to present to the Father? A bride that is holy and without spot. Not fat and happy. Holy and without spot. This is an authoritative command. Number two. Church family discipline, according to our text, is relational. 
and intentional. Back in verse 6 it says that you would draw from every brother who walks disorderly. Brother, verse 14 says this. If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle... Note that person. Did you catch the intentional? The relational is, they're your brother. Intentional is, you make note of it. You're paying attention. We need to be paying attention to each other's lives. Not nosy. Don't be annoying. (coughs) But paying attention. Something's off about them. And after prayer and so forth, sitting down, what's going on? And they talk to you, and they maybe they say, they say, well, this is going on, and that's why I haven't been as engaged with the church. And you sit there, and don't give them your opinion and say, well, old, old Pappy used to say. No, you give them the Bible, and you, and you lovingly plead with them to return to righteous behavior. <coughs> Number three, church family discipline is consistent and unifying. I emphasize Consistent. Because if it's not consistent, it will not be unifying. Look in verse 6 once again. That you withdraw from every brother. That means that if the member gives $5 a week, Or if the member gives $5,000 a week, sin is sin. There's no preference. We're not going to handle this situation and say we're going to turn a blind eye to this just because they offer more, quote unquote, with a worldly vision to this body. No. He said you withdraw from every brother that walks disorderly consistently and then in verse 7 it says this for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us for we were not disorderly among you for you everyone everyone is to be under the same umbrella of discipline no one is not saying oh well, this is this No, sinful behavior requires the same for each individual. Number four, church family discipline. And this is where we get to the heart of the matter, okay? It sounds very harsh coming right now. You're thinking, Pastor Blake's a meanie. Pastor Blake likes confrontation. Pastor Blake just wants to crack some skulls, okay? No, church family discipline is for restoration. Verse 15. Yet do not count them as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. The reason that I'm sitting down with you, the reason that even after that meeting, I've brought two others that love you, is because I'd rather die then you be lost in your sin. I'd rather have the awkward conversation. And I've been on the recipient of this. I'd rather you you struggle with your affection for me for the rest of your life than for you Struggle and continue on in this sin. Do you feel the love for restoration there? To sit down with someone and have that awkward conversation. You think we we want that? No, I want to come in and sing, oh, happy days, you know. And just, I mean, everybody, I mean, if it was the will of Blake... Everyone follows the scriptures. Everyone loves Jesus. Everyone evangelizes the gospel. Everyone's passionate about spreading seed. Everybody's passionate about the local church ministry. Everybody's living righteous and holy lives. Everybody's getting along great. That's the will of Blake. But sometimes 
it doesn't happen. And we have to sit down and we have to reason together and confront one another and tell people, say, I know you wish that I would just turn my head from this. But I love you too much to do that. Remember the father and the mother we talked about with the child. The child in the moment thinks that they're just living life up and everything's great for them. But they don't realize that they are now living in habits that will be crippling to them later. And their parents will be the ones to blame. Free choice, yes, absolutely, this child. But the parents have a part in it. And you're saying, well, are you my daddy? Are you my mama? No, I'm your brother. I'm your brother who loves you. We're brothers and sisters. We're a family. That's why we're calling it church family discipline. But Paul said one more thing in this text. Church family discipline is taxing. In verse 13, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good or in well doing. Haven't we used that one in the wrong context before? The context of this one is is church discipline, it's confronting a brother. And how many times, and and we've been there, haven't we, church leadership before? We've had to talk to some people or we've had to address some things. And it's like, I just want to come and just sit. I just want to come and just, and, and not have a problem. And we think it's because of all the working of the ministry. But Paul says here, as you are confronting these, and remember the context is, there's Christians in this local church who have just said, Jesus Christ is coming, so I'm not going to work. I would be far better off just to go talk to some people about Jesus. I'm not working. They weren't providing for their family and they started to mooch off people because of the social system that was implemented by the local New Testament church. You know what they did? They took care of each other. Why? Because many of these people, when they professed faith in Christ, their family didn't come with them. They didn't have anybody else. All they had was the church. They had their job and they had the church. Some of them lost their job because of the church. And so some people were saying, well, listen, I'm just not going to work because Jesus is coming. So what's it matter anyway? So I'm just going to, I'm just, you know what? They'll give me something. I'm struggling. I mean, I'm their brother. They've been commanded that if I'm hungry, to let me eat. If I need clothes, to put them on. And see, they're taking advantage of the situation. Paul says, go and confront them about this. They're in sin. Church discipline. I'm not trying to implement perfection or behavior modification. I'm not, um, I'm not giving the implication today that we need, to, uh, we need to watch our behavior because somebody might be looking over your shoulder right now. It's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is this. Is that in the event, and by the way, this shouldn't be something that's regularly happening. But we do recognize that young Christians need help with this. Okay? Older Christians sometimes need help with this. So nobody's immune. Every brother. What I'm saying is that we, as brothers and sisters in Christ of Emmanuel Church, have an obligation to one another. To one another. You say, well, what about all my brothers and sisters in Christ who aren't here? Yes, you do have an obligation to them. But it's different. There's people over in China that are brothers and sisters in Christ that I'll never meet. Okay? If I meet them, I can encourage them. I can exercise the one another's of encouraging but I don't know their life. Okay? There's an implication there. I mean, we could talk about membership right now. I know some people are, you know, you know, when you start talking about membership. But, but it's actually a very, very biblical thing. How in the world can you strike someone from the record if you don't have them on record? Paul said that. 
First Corinthians chapter five. Strike them from the record. They're not a member. They still were able to come to the lo- to the local assemblies. And by the way, if someone's in sin and they get to the bottom part, well, by no stretch, of, I'm, I'm going. We're going to have to do a, st- a study on the details of practical church discipline. Today, it's about the heart. We should be passionate about restoring our brethren to a life of holiness and passion for Jesus. And that's what Paul here is rally, I mean, he's, he's wrapping up this letter. I have a few verses left. And he says here, even in the things that we kind of see as small, like laziness, we should, be, we should be vigilant for each other. Because we don't want seeds of sin to be planted. Because what happens, they germinate. And they manifest. So, church discipline. What's our thing? God's people are a means of grace. Those who are genuine believers in Jesus, genuine believers... God has called you to help sustain and empower other people to live the Christian life. 